everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick. And uh, I'm very excited today to be sitting down with two extraordinary musicians and uh, two ladies that I feel very fortunate to, uh, to get to work with on a regular basis. Uh, Maestro Julie McBride uh, and, and our French horn player, Judy Inchi Lee. Uh, Julie is a proud native of Cincinnati, Ohio. Big Bengals fan too. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from uh, the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and followed that up by moving to New York and going to the Manhattan, excuse me, the Manus School of Music. Uh, she started her career in New York City in earnest in 2005 and has gone on to become one of the most highly regarded musical directors on Broadway. She's currently the musical director of Moulin Rouge, the musical. Uh, previous to that, she held the same position with SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical, Inc. the musical, Head Over Heels. Uh, she's also served as associate uh, conductor, assistant conductor, keyboardist for numerous other Broadway productions. Judy Inchi Lee is a native of Taiwan. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the Eastman School of Music and then followed that up with a master's at Indiana University. Uh, she's gone on to become one of the most in-demand French horn players here on the freelance scene in New York City. Um, she's currently the French horn player at Moulin Rouge. Uh, she has performed with Ray Charles, Harry Connick Jr., Audrey McDonald, uh, Jason Robert Brown. She's also recorded for CBS, uh, NFL Films, uh, PBS Great Performances, and Netflix, just to name a few. She's also performed with the New Jersey Symphony and the American Symphony Orchestra. And in addition to her uh, very successful career as an instrumentalist, she's also very passionate about serving the arts community as an arts administrator, as she spent uh, eight years running the New Jersey Symphony Community Engagement Program and is currently uh, the Chief Programming Officer of uh, Maestro Music, also the very proud mom of two wonderful young lads, Ethan and Evan. Um, and I also want to give a special thank you to Maestro Music for allowing us to use their wonderful space here today. So um, before we jump in, I just want to thank both of you for uh, coming on today and I'm um, really looking forward to uh, talking about all, of, all the things that have uh, led you guys to your uh, extraordinary careers. Let's start, uh, let's start with the early years. Well, let's talk about Cincinnati a little bit and growing up and maybe uh, what, what, you know, attracted you to become a professional musician. Sure. Um, well, so I was, you know, growing up in Ohio, I had two parents that were um, both musicians. So oh, I studied, I yeah. Oh, okay. And I studied classical piano my whole time growing up. And, um, you know, I thought I'd probably go into a career as a classical pianist <laughs> or, you know, something like that. Um, but in high school, I started working. Um, there was a program in Dayton, Ohio, just about 30 minutes north of where I lived, um, where they brought in, at the time, professional music. Uh, there was a music director and a choreographer from New York City they brought to Dayton, and they put on these amazing um, musical productions with high school students. Hmm. So I actually, in my sophomore year in high school, I went to audition to play the piano chair in Wizard of Oz for this production, and I got it. And that's kind of the moment where I was introduced to musical theater, and I never imagined I'd probably have a career in it, but hmm. it kind of piqued my interest then. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. Judy, how about you? I'd grown up in Taiwan. What was the uh, experience like for that? And leading you towards uh, the French horn. Yeah, nothing like that. Um, I grew up in Taiwan, and um, growing up in Taiwan, it was always studying class. In Asian culture, pretty much every kid studies an instrument as part of our well-rounded education system back mm. then. Mm -hmm. um, but playing the French horn was not my first choice. My piano was actually my first instrument. But um, I, I, I auditioned in third grade for this special talented class when I was, was, was little, and we had to pick a second instrument. The school principal actually called my parents up because I've always been tall for as an Asian um, woman, and the principal actually called my dad up and said, all the other instruments has been picked except for the French horn. <laughs> the French horn's great. It's much cheaper than the violin. Yeah. <laughs> and my dad literally said, so. So that's how I started on the French horn at third grade. Um, from there, I continued to, I really, once I started playing it, I fell in love with it. I love the rich sound. Um, and I love that French horn is the bridge between brass instrument and the woodwind instrument. Um, so I really, I practice 
probably could have practiced more, but I practiced <laughs> on it and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then at age 15, uh, my private teacher in Taiwan at the time, he was um, part of, he's, he was affiliated with a high school here in America. So he encouraged me to audition for the school here. Um, the, the town doctor actually went to Taiwan to recruit and he listened to me play at the time and then offered me a full, full scholarship. So that's when that kind of prompted my move here hmm. to the United States when wow. I was 15. And so well, let's talk about that. So you went to the Eastman School of Music following that up. So what was yes. and I And IU, of course. Yeah. What were those experiences like for you? Um, it was interesting because when, <laughs> when I first moved here, I didn't speak any English uh, when I was 15. I mean, we wow. studied English back in Taiwan, but you know, I knew all my ABCs and I knew how to count, but I really didn't know how to converse. Um, so when I first came to this country, it was a lot of just staring at the teacher and trying to pretend I understand what they're saying, but I really didn't. Um, so that's, that's mostly my high school year for three years. Um, music really was the bridge for me to start making friends because I didn't speak English. So music was my language to communicate with peers during, our, you know, during rehearsals and all that. Um, once I got to Eastman as an undergrad, my English was a little better, but still not great. I would still have a vivid memory of in the lesson with Vern Reynolds at Eastman. And um, he would say something to me. I caught him because he retired right after I got there. Um, during the lessons, he would tell me something, and it was very clear that I had no idea what I was saying, and I would just play whatever I wanted to play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he would drop his pencil. He goes, you little rascal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was kind of my years, like transitioning, getting better at English and getting to know the culture a little better. Um, then when I was in IU, that was a completely different environment then, because then I was, I was fully immersed in America and really truly to learn to appreciate the people and culture here. Mm -hmm. Well, if it makes yeah. you feel any better, uh, when Vern Reynolds coached my brass quintet, I had the same approach. I just said, like, yeah, we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> <No. laughs> he didn't like me, actually. He, he had stronger words than rascals for me. <laughs> Julie, how was uh, Cincinnati Conservatory? Did they have, was that a, a theater program that was fostering your interest in the in yeah, well, theater? Yeah, I mean, I did go to Cincinnati to study classical piano, but you know, they do have a great theater program there. Uh -huh. And I remember I would try to, um, you know, I really wanted to be more involved with the theater department. Um, and I got a lot of feedback from my professors, like, do not do that. You need to stay focused on classical music. So I just found myself kind of sneaking and like kind of doing it under the radar. Um, right, kind of a jazz thing. Kind like of the, a jazz the jazz. thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're not doing that. Yeah, <laughs> but no, it was a good opportunity. I, I played in the pits of several musicals there. I did a little like, um, I would play for their voice lessons, for the theater kids' voice lessons. I was supposed to be playing for the classical singers' voice lessons, but I would kind of uh. do the other thing. So it got me a little in more into the, the vibe. Uh-huh theater cool yeah what was let's let's keep it keep it rolling forward there what was it like when you got to new york like i know maybe even after you went to manis like how how was those those yeah. beginning years for her for it's always tough for all of us as musicians but i would expect for women it's even even just add to the challenge level yeah um so, what was the question <laughs> <laughs> when i got to new york yeah just like what was like your like, you know, the, the starting point of in trying to jump into that world. I mean, you're a you're very young person and like achieve so, you know, very fast, not fast. I'm sure it doesn't feel fast to you, but you've ascended to the top of the top of the uh, ranks here. So I was just. Yeah. You know. So it's interesting, too, once I got to Manus and was also doing a, a, you know, a degree in classical music there, I continued the tradition of sneaking off against my <laughs> professor's <laughs> advice. Like shortly before I moved here and started my master's degree, I saw an ad on Playbill.com where Disney Theatricals was advertising for, um, they, they had a music internship program. Oh, so cool. I applied and, you know, they accepted me into the program and I got placed at the Lion King. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, Joe Church was the conductor there. Sure. Um, so I would go to my, you know, classes during the day, but then at night I would go to the theater and I would sit in the pit and I would do whatever, 
like little tasks, you know, I needed to do. Um, so that's where I met my first like Broadway music director. And from that point on, Joe Church really mentored me. Mm. Um, nice. And as soon as I finished Manus, it was like two years later, they actually, um, I was able to start subbing at the Lion King. Oh, okay. Wow, that's great. Yeah, just because of the connections I had made through the um, the internship program. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Joe for a long time. It's yeah. nice to hear that he was such an important mentor to you. Yeah, he's your, one of my greatest my... mentors. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. How about for you, Judy, like the beginning of uh, the New York experience? Um, it was quite interesting. Um, like Julie, I never thought I would be playing in a musical in this musical musical theater industry. You know, as a French horn player, I was like, I'm auditioning for an orchestra. That's all I can do. I'll play in brass quintets. You know, that's in, I had a very narrow mind of what French horn can do when I was in school. Um, it was not until when I was at IU, um, I met my husband. He's a trumpet player, and he's the one kind of introduced me to different genres of music, actually. And so I started listening to jazz, I started listening to big bands, and I started listening to all different styles of things and realizing, wow, there's so much more than Mozart and Beethoven <laughs> and Mahler. Um, and because of it, I started recording sessions with, at, at Indianapolis, there's a huge recording scene there. Um, and that's also when I, I went on the road with um, Beauty and the Beast. That was my first show. Um, James was on the road, the national tour, and at the end of the couple, at the, at the end of the tour, the original horn player had quit, and because I knew James and I, I had supped on the show a couple of times, so when he left the show, they offered me the position to basically finish the tour. So that was my first experience of playing in a Broadway show. Um, from there, when I moved to here to New York, finally. That was also the first show I subbed at. Um, Tony Ciceri was my was the first one took a leap of faith in me. Um, he was the second horn in Beauty and the Beast, and I went to play for him when I first got here. And I still remember I love Tony to pieces. I went to play for him and play some things. And afterwards, he was sitting there and he goes, "Okay, I'll bring you in." <laughs> And from there on, um, I was very lucky. Then I started stopping on other other shows. And actually, shortly after that, I was offered my first show, um, Young Frankenstein. That was my, I was stopping at producers and the, the music director, Patrick Brady, he was the one who kind of helped me with my first big break mm -hmm. in essence. So. It's, I think we first met uh, on some sort of studio session for maybe it was CBS News or the yeah. NFL stuff or whatever, whatever it might be. But it always struck me, and it still does to this every time we play Moulin Rouge together, how, you know, French horn players, it's, some of the time that their, their stylistic interpretation can be more rooted in the classical side because that's where you spend most of your time focusing on, you know. So whereas trumpet and trombone players generally have more opportunities in the commercial side of things and jazz, whatever. But you were like always like so easy to play with because you just like, it's like there's another trumpet player or trombone player, a real good trumpet player, a good yeah. trombone player sitting there and the, the French horn doesn't feel like, oh, this is, you know, the, the, this strange element to, our, the, to the horn section, quite the contrary with you. So whatever you did back then certainly uh, laid the foundation for just great work and it's like we all say that everybody who gets to work with you so well thank you i appreciate um, that well a lot of the reason why we wanted to sit down today is to kind of give a, a real formal introduction to the people that uh follow uh my stuff at, at hip bone music um an, an introduction to meister music and the organization and the the mission statement for it all the work that's already gone on i uh, I'm sad to say I didn't know as much as I felt I should have. I, I've been researching for this interview, and uh, it's it's quite an, an impressive organization doing like really important work. And uh, I thought you know both of you guys are involved and and have you know such strong impressive careers already. But I know this is a broad question, <laughs> but maybe just tell us about Meister Music. Tell us you know a little bit of the history and uh, and and really what what. The, you know, maybe the goals and, and what, what it stands for. Sure. Um, so currently I'm the chief program officer here at Maestro Music. Um, I oversee all the programs, which we do a lot. Um, Maestro Music started in 2017 by Georgia Stitt, 
She is the president and founder of the organization. And the backstory was back in 2017, she was working with uh, Mary Mitchell Campbell. So they were tasked um, at an off-way Broadway show to put together all a full, all full, full <clears throat> excuse me, all female band, six people, and they had such trouble putting together that six mm. people, mm -hmm. female, all, all, full, mm -hmm. all female um, band. And at the time, Georgia realized that there is a need for this database, like basically try to make sure that we can we can create a community that we know where to look for these amazing artists who are female and non-binary musicians in this industry, oftentimes are just hidden or have been historically marginalized in the mm -hmm. past. Um, from there, it literally started with a Google Sheet to now today, we are a nonprofit organization. We have over 1,700 members in the directory and it's global wide. We have um, members in, in um, UK with members in Australia, Canada, um, Japan, and uh, we just recently have a new chapter in Germany. And I'm working with Marsha, as you know, in Mexico, we're about mm -hmm. to start a group, affinity group in Mexico City. So oh, we'll great. have, yeah, so we're literally trying to expand this reach. And really the goal for Maestra is to provide support, visibility and community for for us, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Our mission, you know, our idea is it's always yes and. Okay, it's everyone should be included, should everyone should have an opportunity to be successful. You know, it's not about excluding people, it's about how we can all work together as a community to support each other. Mm -hmm. So that's what really my story is about. Mm -hmm. um, I started here just a little, literally about a year ago. Yeah, I um, remember when you started. Yeah, yeah, and since then I have I feel like I've found a new family in a way that I've never felt before. Um, you know, as a French horn player, as a female Asian French horn player, I'm often the only one who is in the room, in the recording sessions, I'm sure. Like, as you remember, oftentimes when I see you in the recording session rooms, I'm, I'm always, usually, oftentimes the only one, especially as an Asian female brass mm -hmm. player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been so grateful for things that I've done, and but I, to be completely honest, I also felt kind of lonely. You know, I'm, it's it would be nice to have a little someone else that I can have lunch <laughs> with. You know, in that sense, so we can share some of the thoughts with. Um, so that's what really my story is about. And I, Julie has been instrumental actually from the very beginning. You were involved from very early on too. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience yeah, as sure. a mentor. Yeah, the the um part of Meister that I've been most heavily involved with is the mentorship program. Mm -hmm. And I've been mm -hmm. mentoring ever since the, um, the program was started. Um, and, you know, it's just a really amazing opportunity because I guess thinking back on my career, you know, I, I was trying to start working here in New York City before, I'll just say it was fashionable to hire a woman mm -hmm. to, to be in my position. Mm -hmm. you know, now it's kind of you know, desired and fashionable sure. enough, for visibility yeah. reasons. Yeah. But um, at the time it just wasn't. And so I did face a lot of um, kind of obstacles just because of, you know, being a woman. But um, the thing that, the, I think the reason that I am where I am is because I had peop a lot of people that showed interest in me and mentored me informally, you know, without mm -hmm. a, a program. And I, that's kind of luck on my part. Like I had Joe Church, Mary Mitchell Campbell I also ran into, Wendy Cavett, Laura Burquist. These are kind of my people in my life who have mentored me informally to kind of be, you know, the the leader and the music director I am now. And so I think it's, um, what I think is so cool about the Meister program is that it is a formal program and people who might not have the opportunity to be here in the city and like just randomly cross paths with the person doing what they want to be doing. They have the opportunity to apply to this program and get, you know, one-on-one -on -one training and mentorship with the mentor. So I've, um, yeah, I'm very passionate about this mentorship sure. program, yeah. just kind of looking back on how I got to where I am and um, just giving that back and sort of feeding, you know, keeping, like, let's fill the pipeline. Um, 
So it, that seems to be yeah. one of the things that I think is really impressive is, is like, the, as you just said, fill the pipeline, because now we have to get these generations now that are, you know, just starting. They're thinking about playing a young Judy Liu's thinking about playing a French horn. You know, so important to get them going. And I've seen both of you firsthand at, at uh, Moulin Rouge bringing in young ladies in there, you know, just like you guys, very, very talented and deserving of all the opportunities that and they and to have them struck have to have the structure to have it laid out like that is is terrific and in point of fact if i may is uh stephanie who's just come down and just started subbing uh on uh, french horn for judy and is phenomenal i mean one of the best subs we've had uh, if maybe even the best i mean she she just fit in like uh like just like you i mean and i was shocked i mean she looks like you know her mom gave her lunch money to go to the, to the <laughs> theater today but uh <laughs> But she's also fantastic. She gives it right back to us, you know, when we do that. And she goes, yeah, I'm used to, I, 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 this is the first time I've been up this late. You know, it's, it's so, she knows how to deal with us. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yes, yeah. very much so. But all, all kidding aside, I mean, here she came in and, and we're thinking, how, well, how's this going to work? She's never played a show before. You get, to, you get through the overture and like, this is fantastic. And I, I said to her at the first intermission after play, I said, how did you learn how to play like this? She goes, oh, I used to play uh, trumpet in a high school jazz band. So just like all of us, we had different experiences that help us mold into playing whatever it might be, in this case, a Broadway show. But anyway, not to get too far off it, but you know, there, there's a perfect example of how, how much that mentorship pays off. And now she's not only in the pipeline, she's there and doing great work already. And she's gonna be a mentor, I'm sure, because of the work that, that you guys have done. And I know you brought in, a young lady was what the conductor that came in a couple of times. Like her name is escaping me at the moment, but I mean, who gets like that opportunity at that yeah. at that point in their musical life? You know, so yeah. so I I think it's tremendous, and I, I applaud both of you for uh, for putting that effort into that because it is effort, right? It's effort, yeah. It takes time and energy, um, but it's worth it. Yeah, for sure. And you can't do it all the time, you know, but. At least that's how I feel. I can't. You do. There's a lot going on always, and it does take the energy. So you, I want to be focused about it when I do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like, you know, you mentioned Joe and and the other mentors that you had, and and you kind of made it sound like you were lucky, but I don't think it was luck at all. I think they probably recognized in you the talent and the expertise that you already possessed, and they were just, they felt you deserved it. But. Uh, I, it seems to me one of the great things that you guys are doing with Maestra is 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 enhancing the level, you know. And so now you have all these people who are going to be on your guys' back and be able to use that as a springboard for them, just like old white people like myself had the same thing. You know, it, the structure has just been there because of however, for whatever reason, messed up or not, but that's been the structure. And now there needs to be a structure for, for like, like you said, Judy, everybody to, to be able to, uh, um, you know, show their talents and see, you know, how give, give an opportunity to prove themselves. You know? Yeah, I just want to kind of explain that on the, a little bit, because I think one of the things that is worth mentioning is we all have experiences. I don't want to speak for you, Julie, but I know that I definitely have experienced being a token in the room, you know, sure. like um, yeah. sometimes, you know, people might, people know that they have to hire someone who looked apart, who is, um, who is trying to, f to fill that vote um, that when we talk about DEI, when we talk about diversity, when we talk about inclu inclusion. Um, but personally, I've always felt like it's so important for the person in the room to actually do an amazing job when you're there. You're not just there because of the way you look. You're not just there because you are a token. And the tokenism is it's something that's very harmful for, for what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. um, so what Maestra Music is trying to do is, it's not just making sure that everyone has the opportunity to be there, but it's also to foster that supportive community and that system to make sure 
was setting people up for success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's exactly what the mentor, mentorship is about. It's, that's exactly what our virtual technical workshop is about. Um, our monthly meetings, when we're meeting together, when we're mingle, mingling, when we're talking to each other, it's a very supported system. And when there are questions, when we know that sometimes you just don't know what to do, you have someone to turn to and you have someone to help guide you to make sure that setting you up for, you know, to, for success. Like when you mentioned Stephanie, for example, when I bring someone in who, let's say, is a little more experienced, who has done shows before, um, I don't have to think about too much. Like just usually just, all right, here's a book. You come watch the show and I leave them alone to prepare. But I did, like what Julie was saying, I did make sure I had a, I have many specific conversations with Stephanie to say, these are the things you do. You have to make sure you watch the book. You have to study it until you're so bored of it before you even come in. You know, it's so like the preparation of it to make sure that we're really setting someone up for success. It's so crucial. And that's something that we take a lot of pride in at Maestra because mm -hmm. that we believe in that and we think that that's how we can make sure that it's a competitive field and stay competitive. Because we all, we are so proud of, we are all so proud of being in this profession that, you know, it, there's certain level of expectations. And we want to make sure that whoever we bring in, whoever is in this field meets that level. That's, to me, it's one of the most important things to make sure that we deliver mm -hmm. that. I think that's awesome. And I think, I think that is really important, you know, and, and, I think, you know, everybody's always, you know, people have their complaints, this and that and this and that, and, you know, oh, everything should be based on merit and everything should be blah, 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 blah. It's, it's never that. It's always based, I'm not saying that that might be a big percentage of the hire, but it's also, are you, I mean, Julie's an incredibly great conductor. She's also one of the easiest people to work for because you you want people to succeed, you know, and you want, you don't. I know how you are seeing, having worked two shows with you. You don't like to nix people. You don't like, you want, the, 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 and that's in that you, the, everyone says that about you. As soon as we, I mentioned your name to other people, they're like, oh, she's the best. And, and you are, I mean, it's a, you do a great job and, and, but also the completely taking care of business on the music front. So it's, um, but anyway, back to my point was, you know, sometimes it's based on if you're easy to get along with, sometimes it's based on other factors and the fact that you're, uh, attuned to that, Judy, I think is really important. Like, of course, I'm sure there are many times that you feel like you're the token woman, Asian woman there, and that can't feel good, you know? And then you deliver, of course, on very high level playing wise. So then that is no longer the case, but it may still be the case to you, you know, because you're feeling that. And, uh, and I do think that's really great, the mentorship program that you have, because now the structure is, uh, you're able to, the infrastructure is set up for them to, to for the level to be continually high and to and to go from there so long-winded way of saying you know <laughs> I, I think it's great i mean this interview isn't, isn't about me but i'll just try to make this story as short as possible the first time i subbed on broadway uh was the at the original annie i was a in between my sophomore and junior year of uh, college at eastman and i came down to meet birch johnson who was a big successful trombone player and one of my favorite players of all time and uh, we were hanging out and he said, oh, do you want to go see the show tomorrow? And so I was like, you know, sit in the pit. And I'm like, oh, man, it's totally excited. I don't even know what that means. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah great. So it was at the Gershwin Theater at the time and, uh, and we had Birch there. And the first Ramon player, Tony Studd, had gotten a spider bite. Also, oh, he says it was a spider bite. He spent a lot of time at the bar across the street oh. afterwards. So <laughs> not 100% sure about the spider bite situation. But um, they, they couldn't get... Um, Let's make sure that's they, not in here. Yeah. This was back in the era where there was a pay phone outside the pit. And they, there was no cell phones. And so they would run out there. And so they kept trying to get a sub for the whole show. They couldn't get anybody. And so the conductor comes down off the podium and says, uh, well, what about this kid? I'm not even in the union at the time. <laughs> and uh, and he, 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 I said, I don't, I don't have my horn here. And Birch was like, okay, you play my horn. I'll play Tony's horn. So we went across the street to this restaurant. Tony got completely sloshed. We, I, I didn't drink at the time. I've made up for it since then. But uh, um, at any rate, we went back in. I play, I'd never played a show before, so I'm sure it was not very good. And the conductor gets done at the end, and he comes down, and he goes, yeah, you can come back whenever you want. I'm just like, 
<laughs> it, it, but the point of the story is that there was a looseness about Broadway that has gone away, that should have gone away, mm -hmm. you know? Like, it's so it, it's, it, there's no reason for it to get to that point where some greenhorn kid is going to be subbing on, on Broadway. But it, it's so refreshing to see that, that this, what you guys have created through Meister, but in particular in the mentorship, whether it be an actual Meister mentorship program or just your general uh, approach to mentoring, it's like, you don't have to have a situation like that come yeah. up again. I'm sure it won't. But, uh, Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> I still can't believe that. I don't know. That. You might have to conduct the show. Yeah. You, if worse comes to worse. Yeah. And that would be worse. Yeah. That would yeah. be the worst that comes to worse. <laughs> I can see your phone ringing with every member of the cast oh, yeah. right after that, you know. <laughs> we need to talk Producers to you. Probably, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been awesome, like hearing, hearing, you know, just about Meister Music. I think it's really important that we get the word out there and, and you guys are clearly doing that and doing all this amazing work. I'm a really big person on short-term and long-term goals. And I wanna ask you guys both about your long-term vision for yourself and then also for your involvement with Meister Music and where you would like to see things, see things go. Once, should we start with you, Julie? Are you all right, Donna? Sure. I, I, I think long-term goals. You know what would be great in like ten years from now is if Maestra had grown even exponentially from where we are now in terms of directory and people knowing about it, and that it's less of a. Um, kind of niche thing that it's um a, just a, a little bit more you know part of our normal routine mm -hmm, yeah like mm -hmm. of course Meister's there and there's more women in the pits and there's and doing all of the things related to our business so that mm -hmm. we're not looking i, I don't ever want to have a conversation ever again that's like we really have to hire at least one woman mm -hmm. no that because let there's right. there's so many you know capable and ready women yeah, at that point. For sure. Yeah. And for yourself personally, are you, I, I selfishly hope you keep being a music director and I keep being <laughs> on your shows. But, uh, but other than that, I, I, are you, do you see yourself, are you where you like to be in terms of being a musical director? And yeah. I mean, I am. Oh, good. I don't know. Good. <laughs> That's what we want to hear. Maybe I've peaked, but I, I, I don't oh, see I don't, I don't, not, I wasn't saying that at all. We're, all of us are just hoping you answer yes. That's what I like to do. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Judy, how about yourself? Um, I guess long term for me personally is a little, as a French horn player, I always feel like my time is already limited. Like, I'm already <laughs> like, I just like, you know, we were talking about this earlier about brass players, like just, you can feel great one day and then you play horribly the next day. Um, so that's also part of the reason why I pursue arts administration because I mm. do feel like I, I would love to, I like these opportunities and to do different things and I like to tackle this art field in different angles. Um, so I'm looking to further perhaps on the arts administration side and keep up with the French horn playing for as much as I can. Um, but currently it's working simultaneously, but who knows if one side can take more shifting wise. Um, so that's kind of working towards, but I don't really, I don't have a clear vision yet in 10, 10 years where it would be. Um, as far as Maestra, I do want to plug a little bit that we have a new initiative, um, Get to Work, that we are partnering with the Miranda Family Foundation that we are working tirelessly right now to put it together. And we are hoping to launch it and we will most likely launch it during around the Tony's time. So like kind of stay tuned on that. Mm. Um, and the goal and the mission for Get to Work is basically based on what we're doing in Maestra before all the backstage jobs. So we're talking about hairdressers, we're talking about stage managers, we're talking about everyone who's not visible on stage in the music th musical theater industry. All the jobs encompasses all that. Mm. And that's what Get to Work is about. So we're building a huge directory, a database that uh, is modeled after Maestro Music. And um, so that would launch hopefully soon and that will be in the long term. So it's not just the music, not, it's not just the musicians who are trying to serve everyone who's on, in the backstage capacity. Wow, so what really a great exciting. initiative. Yeah, yeah, we'll so keep our really, eyes out for that. Yeah, so that's really exciting. Awesome, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for taking time out. I know we're all headed to rehearsal, but you're, yeah. you're the musical director, yeah. so you gotta get there the, the soonest. But Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. it's my, I'm honored to have you guys. And um, I, I, I'd like to close, and especially with you guys, 
um, you know, you're both young, very young by my standards, and, uh, and uh, you have achieved so much success and, and uh, all of it, you, you're worthy of all of it. Um, I like to end the interviews this way. Can you give me one little bit of advice that you'd give to a young person? And I know you do this on a regular basis with your mentorship program, but the next person who wants to be the next Julie McBride or the next In Chi Lee, you know, what, what do you, what's your one, or it doesn't have to be one piece, but what, what's your advice for, for the young person coming up, Judy? Um, stay curious. Mm. Um, always just be as versatile as you can be. Because I, when I was younger, I was so stubborn. I think it's the Taurus blood in me. I'm a Taurus. And I, <laughs> like, I'm very stubborn. James will tell you. Um, but I... Oh, I, 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 I got it. I got it. <laughs> uh, but keep your mind, keep a very open mind. Um, and just know that sometimes, even when things don't work at the time, it might be a way of telling you that there are other possibilities that is mm. out there for you. Mm. So I would, I would, if I were to tell my younger self, that that's one thing I'll tell myself. So hopefully that will help some young professionals out there. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. How about you, Julie? I think the advice, well, I know the advice that I do give to people who come to me and want to have a career in music direction specifically, I say, well, first find a, find a mentor who's doing exactly what you want to be doing and follow them around. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then the the second part of that is, you know, when you get in these rooms and you're the music assistant or you're the associate or you're the rehearsal pianist, stay focused and keep your eyes open and listen to everything that's going on. Learn the things that you should be doing from the people around you and learn the things you shouldn't be doing from what's going on around. Just take in so all the information yeah. and, you know, that's the most important thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, had, I got my trombone teacher when I was in high school gave me a piece of advice, which was not even close to as what the piece of advice you just gave to the young people. But I told him, I said, Phil, I'm thinking about trying to become a professional trombone player. What do you think about that? And he said, Mike, they need landscapers in San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> so, different. Uh, I wasn't quite expecting that, but uh, I would have preferred your guys uh, more, more helpful advice. <laughs> At any rate, we're, we're ending on a light note, but it's been awesome to talk to you guys today, and thank you for taking time out. You're both so busy with everything going on, and uh, appreciate you uh, sharing all your knowledge and, uh, and all things about Maestro Music. We will keep an eye out for the new initiative and all the work that you guys are doing and future shows that you'll be a big part of, I'm sure. So thank you so much. I hope, uh, hope everybody uh, enjoyed this as much as I did. I had a blast today talking to these two extraordinary musicians. Uh, for those of you who'd like to learn more about Meister Music, and I hope you will, uh, Judy, can you tell us where we, they can find out more good stuff? Sure. Um, so you can follow us on, on Instagram, Facebook, and our website is maestramusic.org. Just as it spells, maestra, M-A-E-S-T-R-A, music.org. And we have all the information there for your mentorship program, our virtual techno workshop, which is free for everybody. So I hope you can visit us and follow us. We will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick. Thank you.